Hi, I'm Matt Boyd. I'm the marketing director at Penguin Press. And I just want to start by saying that I love working in publishing. I've, I've always wanted to work uh, on books with authors, with booksellers, with librarians, with readers. But if, if for whatever reason I wasn't able to work in publishing, I always thought that I would want to be Tom Rinaldi. <laughs> Aim high. <laughs> I, I've been a huge fan of Tom's uh, for a long time. He covers a variety of sports at ESPN. Uh, among those, most importantly to me, are my three favorites, golf, tennis, college football. I don't think that there's anybody else out there who can talk fluently about both the Auburn Tigers and Tiger Woods or Johnny Football and Johnny Mac. Um, but in my mind, what sets Tom apart from other sports journalists is his voice. And I mean that both in terms of his storytelling style, but also his actual voice. I've developed, this is embarrassing, I've developed a kind of Pavlovian response. So whenever I hear Tom on TV, my eyes just instantly well up with tears. <laughs> and <laughs> This is supposed to be a positive introduction. I appreciate you, Matt. Thank you, buddy. But it's for a positive thing. It's, it's because he's created, he's written and produced some of the most heartwarming and heartbreaking documentaries you'll ever see. And these documentaries always have a sports angle, but they're not just sports stories. They're stories about tragedy, triumph, struggle, compassion, hope. They sing the praises of unsung heroes. They challenge us to be the best human beings we can possibly be. And for his work, Tom has won 12 National Sports Emmy Awards and six Edward R. Murrow Awards including one for a piece he wrote called the man, the man in the Red Bandana. And that piece told the story of a young man named Wells Crowther, a Boston College athlete who chose not to leave the World Trade Centers during 9-11, but instead to walk back up the smoke-filled staircases over and over again to save the lives of others. And that piece went viral. It was seen by millions. It inspired people all over the world to honor Wells by wearing his trademark red bandana. It led to charities, led to fundraisers, and when President Obama spoke at the opening of the 9-11 memorial, he told the story of that terrible day through the lens of one life, Wells Crowther. And it's a story that Tom couldn't shake, so with the help of Wells' family, friends, and teammates, he's written The Red Bandana, which gives us a fuller look at the man Wells Crowther was and how he found the strength and courage to risk and ultimately lose his life to save so many others. We are honored to be publishing it this fall at Penguin Press, and please join me in welcoming Tom Rinaldi. Matt, I don't know whether to thank you or blame you for that, but uh, we'll talk afterward. I was, it was suggested to me to start with something a little lighter, to try to get some laughs. You'll never believe this, but when you're a young father, you have to have a dad joke. The one joke that you can tell which is good in every forum. Incredibly, the one dad joke that I possess is actually about a library and about a librarian. So if you'll indulge me, uh, and with much kudos here to the Darien Public Librarian, who I met just a, a bit ago, Stephanie. I'm, I'm just going to give you the joke. So a man walks into a public library. It could be any of your libraries. And by all accounts, he seems to be about his business. He goes back. He, he's in search of the lead librarian. And he finds the lead librarian and says, hello, how can I help you? Can I get a, a cheeseburger and some fries? And the librarian looks at the man and sort of gestures and looks around and says, sir, um, this is the library. And the man says, I'm sorry. Can I get a cheeseburger and some fries? <laughs> I apologize. I just, I'm sorry. I just couldn't, just couldn't help myself. Um, 
I do appreciate uh, Matt's introduction and uh, thank you to Mbolo and, and to Jeffrey for sharing their stories and for the stories to come. Like Mbolo, this is my very first time as a writer uh, addressing a group. And as the father of a 12-year-old and an 8-year-old who are both voracious readers, um, our son reads things that I, I certainly would never read. He's a sci-fi nut. He's read every Harry Potter volume. If it's a serial of any kind, he reads it. Our daughter uh, reads sort of everything after he's read it. So I'm deeply, deeply honored to, to talk to this group today. And as it was referenced earlier, the Lord's work is done here. If reading takes you to another world, we thank you for doing some of the greatest work that can ever be done, which is expanding our world. And we really thank you for that. This story, The Red Bandana, as Matt mentioned, is a story about New York City. Uh, maybe some of the most hallowed ground we'll ever have in these five boroughs, but it's also about the country. I thought about different ways to introduce the story to you, but here's a simple one, and it's with a question. A question all of us, if we're of right mind when the moment arrives, that we're going to face. And I pose it to all of you now. What will you do in the final hour of your life? Where will you be? What will it look like? Who will remember it? Now I want you to think for a moment. You haven't reached your seventh decade, or your eighth, or your ninth. You're 24 years old. Every challenge in your life, you've pretty much met and mastered. You've been an outstanding athlete. You've been an honor student. You've played Division I sports at Boston College. Every single challenge. But while you're a teenager, and even earlier than that, you have this other interest, and that's in being a fireman. From the time you're a little boy, you're four years old, you're presented with one of those sit-in, ride-along plastic fire trucks that are really tough to pedal and steer and ultimately end up in the basement and gather dust. Probably know it. And that's what Wells Crowther got when he was four years old. And he saw his father volunteer at Empire Hook and Ladder Company number one in Upper Nyack, which is not very far from here. Great athlete, great student, volunteer firefighter. Dad was a banker. Mom, a musician. He graduates from Boston College and he has a clear dream. He wants to work on Wall Street, which certainly echoes some of the themes in, in Bolo's novel. He gets a job on the 104th floor of the South Tower working for Sandler O'Neill. At the time, a relatively small financial services company with about 150 employees. He's thrilled. He loves it. And he carries one thing with him that really doesn't fit the corporate wardrobe. The same thing he's carried since he's seven years old. He's carried that. On the way to church when he's seven, wearing his very first suit, his dad helps him tie a tie. He looks at his dad who has a pocket square and he says, can I have one of those? And the dad says, sure. Goes back to the bedroom, opens the drawer, comes back. But then it occurs to Jefferson Crowther, I have a feeling that my son, who tends to get the sniffles and likes to blow his nose, is going to reach for the nice pocket square. And in church, he's going to honk one out and then put it back. So let me give him something else. And Wells puts it in his pocket. And virtually every day, the rest of his life, it stays there. And it's there on September 11th, 2001. Wells has now made it to the trading desk at Sandler O'Neill. By any definition, he seems to be ascendant. He's just gotten an apartment 
in the West Village, which is his dream. Chuck Platts is his roommate, guy that works in Midtown. But there's something still bothering him a little. One month before 9-11, he calls his father. Dad, there's just something I got to share with you. I'm thinking that maybe I want to do something else. His dad, the banker, who has seen his son go through Boston College, get this great job, make it to the trading desk, says, excuse me? I think maybe I want to be an FDNY firefighter. And the dad says, listen, we're volunteers at Empire, at Upper Nyack. It's great. You don't have to chuck that to continue to do this. Think about it. And he argues very rationally to his father. I have thought about it. I know the waiting list is probably going to take four to five years. I'm going to continue to work. I'm going to sock the money away. If I meet somebody, I'll have money for a nest egg for a house. But if I continue to sit and look at this computer the rest of my life, I think I'll lose my effing mind. One month later, flight 175 out of Boston hits the South Tower. It's the second tower to be hit. Wells doesn't leave right away. He calls his mother and leaves her a message to say that he's okay, not to worry. That's 10 minutes after the 175 flies into the south facade of the South Tower. It cuts a swath from the 78th floor to the 84th. On 78 is an area called the Sky Lobby. It's an exchange where people take express elevators and then break off into elevators that go to the highest floors in the tower. Ultimately, Wells leaves the 104th floor. There's only one functional stairwell. Stairway A. He's in it. He's made it. He's on his way down. But he gets to 78, and he leaves the stairwell. And he sees a scene of unimaginable horror. There are as many as 200 people dead and dying in that space. There are fires on the floor. It's smoky. Everything you can imagine about the dimensions of hell are what he steps into. And he calls out and he begins to lead a group of people who follow his voice down. One of those people is named Ling Young. She works for the New York Department State of Taxation on the 86th floor. She's terribly burned but deeply in shock. She doesn't know how bad off she is. She hears this voice, just keep going, just keep going. So at one point she turns around and looks at the man and she notices for the first time that he's carrying a woman across his back as he makes his way down the stairs. They get to clear air on the 61st floor. He sets the woman down. He says to Ling Young, do you think you can carry this fire extinguisher? She says she'll try. He urges her, continue down. Don't stop. She looks at him. She's shocked. Why are you leaving me? He says one sentence to her. I'm going back up. And he goes up 17 flights back into the sky lobby. And again, he calls out. People hear the voice. There's a woman named Judy Ween, very badly injured. She walks. Two other people follow Judy Ween. They go into the stairwell. They go down. Ultimately, Judy Ween and Ling Young end up in the same ambulance that leads them away one minute prior to the collapse of the South Tower. Wells Crowther made it down to the lobby through stairwell A. He didn't leave. 
he went to the FDNY command post, 75 feet from the rest of his life, and he didn't leave. When his remains were found, 12 other FDNY and a chief named Donald Burns, who was running the command post, were all found in one area. There was one civilian found with them, Wells Crowther. The red bandana is a story about the life that led to that choice and the legacy that follows it, not only for Ling and for Judy, but for the President of the United States, who, when 2,977 people died on 9-11, chose to speak, as Matt said, about one in opening the museum. He chose the man in the red bandana. How was his identity ever discovered? It was discovered by the determination, the curiosity, and the investigation of his mother. She's the one who found out that the man in the red bandana was, in fact, her son. I have a lottery-winning job, guys. I get to cover great athletes and great events around the world. But the greatest part of what I do is I get to tell human interest stories across all sport. I've been doing it for more than 20 years. I've never had a story that I've been fortunate enough to share resonate the way Wells' story has in its television presentation. And that's why there was a, a compelling reason to broaden that narrative and try to present it to people who might understand 9-11, not in mass scale, but through one act one name. As one of his closest friends said, when I asked him, do you think Wells understood the danger that he was in? The friend said, that doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is the choice he made because of what that choice proves. And I asked, what does it prove? And he said, that terror can never win because of a choice like that. Thank you so much for the work you do. We appreciate it so, so much. Thanks.